Welcome to the 2021 Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism Crossroads Conversations. Hosted by Chun Choi and Jeffrey S. Nesbitt, Crossroads Conversations expands upon the Guest Cities Forum and provides a more intimate setting to examine pressing questions centered around design discourse, environmental research, and the status of our profession. In this mini-series, we invite leading designers, architects, and urbanists from around the world to discuss contemporary topics across architecture, landscape, and society. Welcome. Well, welcome to the Crossroads Conversations. And tonight's speaker, tonight's guest is Professor Michael Jacob. Let me introduce him uh, briefly. So Professor Michael Jacob is based in Geneva, uh, teaches at EPIA, as well as uh, many other schools. And he's the founder of Comparison, uh, International Journal on, on Comparative Literature, I believe. And he also makes um, many interesting exhibitions uh, through which we got to know his work, actually. So we'd like to spend some time maybe talking about his latest exhibition that just opened, I assume. Um, what city was it in that the exhibition is in? In Geneva. Geneva. Yeah. And that's Making of Dante was the exhibition. Maybe uh, can you share a little more details about that exhibition before we start your formal talk? It's a Making of Dante or the Fabricating of Dante because Dante died 700 years ago <clears throat> in Ravenna. And uh, since we don't have any manuscript uh, by his hand, we don't have any original manuscript, uh, the work of Dante has been fabricated, that is produced, copied <clears throat> by many, many people who came together in order to give us the texts which we simply buy today in a book. So, <clears throat> and it's not only his work, but uh, because his main work, as we all know, is a divine comedy. But there are other works who were almost lost for a certain time. So there was a work of philology in order to bring these texts together and to publish them first in Italian and Latin and then to translate them. But even his face and his body was invented because Botticelli, <clears throat> who is a master artist of the 15th century, he made this very famous portrait of Dante <clears throat> and he invented his face and his body because there was no mask when Dante died. So it's a sort of fantasy Dante, you know, who looks very Italian, very Latin, very Dante-like because we learn to think this is Dante. But actually we don't know how he really looked like, but we know it because since some 10 years ago, uh, a university in Italy, took his skull, his real skull, and reconstructed his face. And so we saw that the real Dante is very different than the, the fake Dante, but since everyone knows the fake Dante, no one wanted to know the real one. <laughs> so you see, we are in the fabricating the myths of a person, the history of a person, and so on. That's, in, that's incredible. I, I'm, I just quickly, we'll, we'll get into it more after your presentation, but briefly, if you can share your your interest in literature, or in, in fact, by the example of uh, the fabrication of Dante, how that relates to your interest in, uh, in the construction of landscape. Well, uh, I, I'm originally trained in uh, philosophy and in literature, and especially in comparative literature. <clears throat> and I even have still have a chair in comparative literature. And the link between the two maybe comes from my interest with nature because the very first courses I gave were on bucolics, on pastoral literature, and the pastoral literature, pastoral generally, is the only domain of literature interested in nature for a very long time. And mm. so there is one step from coming from the representation of nature and literature to, uh, the, to landscape. And then I started some 25 years ago to teach a lot uh, in landscape departments, architectural schools, and so on. It, it makes it makes a lot of sense, actually, because we we uh, in, in in my understanding and my experience in landscape um, is that it, it's always been a kind of representation of of such, and therefore landscape is 
is both both and both a thing and a and a construction of the thing. Absolutely, and historically, we know that landscape, at least in many European languages, the first use of the term landscape in French, in Italian, etc., was uh, referred to something which was painting. It's really a representation, it's an artistic representation of piece of land. And only very late in the 18th century do people start to use the same word landscape in order to speak about mental representation. Well, that was actually why we were interested in inviting you back to the Seoul Biennial, because uh, one of the crossroads um, themes was natural and artificial. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought your talk would really broaden our perspective on that on that topic. So um, before we talk a little for well, we, we will just talk like this for the rest of the night, or we can actually spend a little time listening to a formal talk from Professor Jacob. Mm -hmm. So I should share my screen now, no? Yeah, I think it'll be great if you can. Absolutely. <clears throat> Here I am. So I hope you, you should see it now, by now. I will just try to get to the... to open... Oh, I'm just sorry. Second, and I'm okay. Here I am. Okay, <clears throat> so So one I want, yeah. So I hope you see my screen. It should be okay, yeah? <clears throat> Perfect. <clears throat> Sorry for the short delay. So my general theme is for mountains, artificial mountains. I will try to to tell you something more general on the subject, and then I will comment some specific cases. <clears throat> I think it's a very general and universal theme. <clears throat> it regards many cultures around the world. I, of course, started to concentrate on certain cultures. So I will give you some examples, maybe some extreme examples. These are five mountains you cannot ascend or you cannot <clears throat> it's made by a german artist called wolfgang leib these mountains are just very small they're just centimeters but well i will come back to them and why i think they are important <clears throat> then examples of four mountains are these mountains of rubble uh, most of Europe looks like this after World War II, and especially, of course, Germany, because we know uh, what happened when all these important cities were bombarded, Berlin and other cities which were looking like this. <clears throat> and you will see that I'm always interested in the stories behind these images and be behind these phenomena. This is rubble, this is German history coming together, Walter Benjamin, uh, would have said, this is history as a heap of rubble, which is already something interesting. And of course, uh, uh, some mounds come into mind immediately. We're still in Berlin. This is the Teufelsberg, the mountain of the devil. It's the highest point of view. It's <clears throat> in Berlin, more than 100 meters high. And this is a real mountain of debris, of rubble which was put together and uh, we'll see it a little later too. It's really the German history of the World War II which becomes here a symbolic mountain. 
And I will come back to, to the sense of symbol, but just this is just a very brief introduction into our general theme. <clears throat> why, uh, why look to artificial mountains? Why look to mounds, heaps and other constructions which are man-made? Of course, when we start to be curious for these forms, we'll see that, for instance, in Europe, in the Northern Europe, in France, in Belgium, in Germany, <coughs> there's there are, uh, dozens and hundreds and maybe even thousands of these hips of these tips. extraction of ore, extraction of all kinds of material. And then when the industry, uh, when the industries uh, start, um, uh, don't care anymore about what they extracted, very often we have these artificial topographies which were built. Artificial mountains are works of art too. This is Mark Tobin who uh, built several of these termite hills. <clears throat> So this is an artist of the 20th century imitating the work of insects who are capable of working and creating these very surprising forms, mini mountains, if you want. Then we have the history of reliefs of models, <clears throat> models of the Alpine chain, which had their importance, especially in the 17th and 18th century, even a political importance. Another important uh, example of artificial mountains are um, uh, these constructions. This is uh, the zoo in Paris, Zoo de Vincennes, and it's a mountain uh, rock, a piece of rock, <coughs> fake rock for mountain, constructed by the engineers of the 20th century, 54 meter high. It's not so easy to do something like this. And it was renovated a short while ago. So you see um, that it enters the, the theme of, if we deal with artificial mountains, we deal with, with very different um, realities. <clears throat> Maybe one of the oldest examples is this incense burner from China. It's called Boshan Lu, <clears throat> and it was used for ritual purposes. Normally you would have inside uh, some uh, boiling liquid and uh, uh, through the openings which are marked here by the sacred mountain, some mist, some vapor would come out and it would mimic uh, clouds. So this is a religious object, but at the same time, it's a sort of topographical object. Maybe it's the oldest 3D map which we have. Of course, it's a sort of fantastic 3D map linked to the sacred mountains, the five sacred mountains, or Mount Aishan, et cetera, but still you see it's a very interesting form. Then sometimes fake four mountains become <clears throat> something very visible and very, which something which we can't touch with our hands. This is a Al-Azhar Al -Azhar Park in Egypt, where an old <clears throat> dump site for 500 years, people used to throw away things, and then it became, uh, a sort of new full mountain, it become a park. And, but it's like Central Park, actually it's a great machine, it's a great artificial construction. And so this is a full mountain too. And we find these kind of mountains too in Europe already 2000 and more years ago. This is Cerveteri near Rome, where some tombstones, where some <clears throat> burial sites took the form of the mountains because the mountains were already by the Etruscans and considered like a symbolic form of eternity. And so we have these very beautiful places. Artists, many artists, this is not Vital, a Swiss artist. He works worked for a long time uh, with uh, artificial mountains. Here it's a sculpture in marble. Or we can think about churches, Islamic architecture in Mali, in Africa, where the mosque is formed by this, uh, um, by this construction, which is a simple construction made by mud. And uh, it's very solid at the same time. And it, it symbolizes mountains too, because mountains are so present in many cultures around the world. The second reflection can bring us to think about materials. This is a German artist called Rutenbeck. <clears throat> you see, he works with 
uh, all kinds of materials like lava and uh, some residual materials which could come from some uh, production, industrial production. Wolfgang Leib's mounds, very many mounds um, uh, are made of pollen. So he spent months and months in order to collect pollen and uh, uh, build these tiny mountains which are highly symbolic. <clears throat> we have by Herbert Bayer a grass mound a small <clears throat> mountain built uh, inside an exhibition room and then planted with um, <clears throat> natural material. So it's a very good metaphor for something which is at the same time artificial and natural. Or again, these <clears throat> industrial mountains, which we can find all over the world, which uh, create really an artificial topography made of tens of thousands of hills and mounds, which we built we humans. And this is something very typical for humans. Or Silbury Hill <clears throat> in Great Britain, probably linked uh, to uh, the burial schemes and traditions of uh, important people back uh, in the past. And I know that you have similar of these mounts in Korea, and we find them in Norway too, and in many places around the world. Or <clears throat> in order to take a different material, still these are amphorae. You know that the whole transport, especially of uh, eatable and drinkable uh, products in for the Romans <clears throat> was in amphorae. And uh, they had so many of these objects back 2000 years ago <clears throat> that they built a hill with these broken amphorae, and it is here in Testaccio in Rome, where archaeologists found it, and they dug down, and they found this old artificial topography is built by these objects which were thrown away. Or potatoes, Giuseppe Benone, the famous Italian artist linked to Arte Povera, he simply took some potatoes and built a mound. And of course, this has a lot of significances because Think of the history of potatoes in Europe uh, when the potatoes were discovered from <clears throat> America and then when uh, great famines in Europe found at least a partial solution, for example, in Ireland and in other parts because people simply started to use potatoes. Or Hans Hake, uh, German-American artist <coughs> who looks for what happens on the shore <coughs> of the sea and things coming together, or a Chinese artist uh, building a, a mountain made of bodies. You see very different uh, materials which come together in order to form these artificial mountains. <coughs> so mountains, uh, mountains are of course linked to verticality, but it's a verticality which is visible. So mountains are the positive sign of something negative. So I like to put this together <coughs> with the negative and the positive. We'll see why. Because for me, artificial mountains, well, mountains have something to do with symbols. Symbol comes from a Greek term and symbolo means to throw together. So the symbol is something which throws together, condensates something. <coughs> and so we see that uh, form like this one, an artificial mountain, <clears throat> is linked to another form, which is digging. We dig, we extract things from the earth in order to build something. In order to build a mountain, to build anything, we have to extract very often things like here in a copper mine. <clears throat> and so the positive and the negative come together and immediately comes to mind Robert Smithson, who in one of his unrealized projects, <clears throat> which he was working on when he died, he wanted to make a huge project in then the biggest copper mine of the world, bigger copper mine in Utah. <clears throat> and he wanted to make a reclamation project. And the idea was to go down into this mountain. It's, for, it's, a, it's a sort of negative mountain. It's a conic form. And to, to make there a sort of work of art, which is a reminder of entropy and the way we use the earth and we extract material and maybe we destroy nature, and certainly we destroy it too. And so this reminded me of another vertical <coughs> conic form, which are the first anatomical theaters when people were sitting 
here, you know, on the benches and looking down what the professors would show them. These were the first places where anatom anatomy was practiced. And it is linked to Dante too, <laughs> because we spoke before about Dante. And Dante's masterwork, The Divine Comedy, has three parts, as we all know. It starts with a descent in hell. And descent in hell is conical because Dante considered that when Lucifer uh, was lost his place in, in, um, in heaven, and then when he, because he betrayed God and he became <clears throat> the chief devil, and then when he fell down, he touched the, the earth and he had so much energy that he drilled a sort of conical form and he, fi he found his final place at the center of the world, <clears throat> which is the coldest place on earth. And it's a, it's a frozen lake and that's where he is. <clears throat> and for Dante, hell, is a descent into an anti-mountain. If you want these nine famous conical terraces, and the more you descend, the more you find terrible sins. And then when we look into the other two parts, purgatory and paradise, they are mountains. So Dante introduced this very powerful idea of the negative and the positive. We have the descent of a negative mountain, and then we have a positive mountain, which is a mountain of purgatory, and then it's a mountain of uh, paradise, of course. And I think this all is connected even to some <clears throat> very interesting places, which are <clears throat> really <clears throat> dealing with uh, my main theme. Uh, if you look to this place, you wouldn't recognize it. This is in Paris. This was Paris before, eight, so a part of Paris before 1866. This is a famous Butte de Chaumont. So you see here <clears throat> negativity, a bare terrain. Uh, these were the Butte de Chaumont, a sort of <clears throat> a very wasteland, uh, not very far from the heart of Paris. <clears throat> and then uh, Alphonse Alphon and General <clears throat> the Préfet Osman, the one who transferred Paris came and it was really, <clears throat> it, it found a metamorphosis into this. This is a park of Bichomont. And this is a, <clears throat> an artificial mountain. You see, <laughs> it's quite impressive. Many people find that it's completely natural. They forget that this is engineering. This is modern engineering. It's a full mountain with a full uh, waterfall, with a full lake, with everything is full. <laughs> everything is man-made, but it looks natural. And even tourists today, many tourists think this is, now, this is the most natural place in Paris, but it's actually a completely full mountain. <laughs> and so this is just to tell you, here you see another, another photography. By the way, it's even a mimesis. It's an imitation of a famous region in France, in Normandy. So I think there is something very Piranesian about this. Something uh, Piranesi already understood that civilization, architecture, urbanism uh, is about constructing, about building the Tower of Babel. This is maybe the darker side of our general scene of four mountains. You see this famous Caspar David Friedrich painting where we see um, um, a sort of entropic uh, full mountain made by these plates <laughs> of the Northern Sea, which give birth to a sort of artificial mountain. So all of this uh, <clears throat> uh, made me very curious. So I started to inquire into the grounds of uh, full mountains, especially in the European history. And one way to explain it is the history of fortifications in the 15th century. Most of the cities in, in Europe were fortified at that time. And Ferrara in Italy is a very good example because when we go to Ferrara, we find this artificial mountain, which is Montagnola, which is a Montagnola, so the mountain. <clears throat> and actually when you dig and you made a lot of constructions, naturally you are faced with the problem, what, I do, what do I do with the material? which I extracted, <clears throat> residual material. And if you want, don't want to put it away and put it uh, far away, then you build a mound. And these mounds, <clears throat> they were very frequent. And inside these kinds of constructions, we have very often grottos, we have caverns. Grottos like this one, which survived in the Boboli Gardens, 
And the grottos were extremely popular in Renaissance Europe. So we have the inside and the outside. And you see when we go to Pratolino, another place in Renaissance Italy, we see this is a representation of the of an important mountain chain in Italy, the Apennines. And this is the, the symbolic giant of the Apennino, but inside there was a grotto. And what is even more interesting behind, you see this is the surviving sculpture by Giambologna, but behind him there was a full mountain. It was the, destroyed only in the 18th century. So one could enter this full mountain. We had the mountain, the visible mountain, and then people could enter the grotto and there were sculptures inside. And so I'm interested in the, in the play between the inside and outside. And here you see another full mountain which existed in Pratolino. And of course, it's Mount Parnassus. Now, Mount Parnassus is a very interesting mountain because Mount Parnassus is one of the three sacred mountains of ancient Greece. <clears throat> and it was a particularly important mountain because the Romans, who didn't know very well <clears throat> uh, Greek geography, they made a confusion between this mountain and another mountain, which is called Helicon. <clears throat> and both of these mountains were sacred to Dionysus and to Apollo, and especially to Apollo. And as you know, Apollo was the god of inspiration, the god of poetry, the god of divination, the god of many things. And he was especially the god of the nine muses. So we see that in the Renaissance, especially, <clears throat> the Italians started, especially in gardens, to build these artificial mountains, which were more mountain Parnassus. And why did they do it? Because they found that these artificial mountains were the place where the ancient <clears throat> authors, artists, and the new ones could symbolically come together. So you have here Mount Parnassus, and on Mount Parnassus you have Pegasus, and Pegasus is the Apollo's sacred horse, which is flying away. And we know that the Greek and the Roman were teaching us that if, you know, when the horse leaped away, <clears throat> uh, the last place when he touched earth will gave birth to a source and it's called the hypocrine source. And if you went and drank at the hypocrine source and you were inspired and you became a big artist. And so you see that the myth of becoming an artist <clears throat> was linked in antiquity to Parnassus and so the Italians started to build mountains, four mountains, which were Parnassus. So we see here the mount between Apennino Colosso, this figure which still survives was one of these mountains. And we have, have here the a representation of Mount Parnassus. It has two peaks and we have Pegasus flying away and the, knife, and the nine muses singing. And here we have the source of inspiration. <clears throat> and in a marriage in 15th century, we see that uh, uh, actually there was a, a procession of people walking and uh, uh, there was a, a, a Parnassus made of cake. <clears throat> so it was a sort of cake and it represented the sacred mountain. <clears throat> and then the Parnassus became a central theme. At that time, we see Parnassus in painted uh, by Raffaello in um, Mount Parnassus uh, in the Vatican. You see the Parnassus is a place where new and old artists, Dante is present here, but of course Aristotle <clears throat> and Plato and all the important geniuses. So for Renaissance Europe, <laughs> Parnassus is a sort of mythical place and it became very logical to build artificial mountains. This is Mantegna, another seminal artist <clears throat> who imagined Parnassus as a sacred mountain. So Parnassus was a very hot topic in the Renaissance and even before Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio and many, many other intellectuals wrote about Parnassus. And so it comes as no surprise <coughs> that Parnassuses were built in many of the most famous gardens <coughs> in Renaissance Europe. Here you see at the left-hand side, this was a Mount Parnassus 
It was very practical too, because you could put some sculptures there and you could organize something linked to the general logic of the garden. Or in Villa Aldo Brandini near Rome, <clears throat> you could build a Parnassus fountain inside a chateau or a castle <clears throat> in order to symbolize that you were interested in the <clears throat> classical values. In a way, it's a very central symbol of Renaissance. It is the symbol of Renaissance because it marks really the comeback to antique culture. And then <clears throat> in the 17th century in Baroque Rome, artificial mountains became very, very important because at that time, especially when we had the election of a new Pope, there were a lot of festivities, ceremonies, and it was called possesso. <laughs> it was when the Pope took possession of uh, the <laughs> church, which consecrated him both as Pope and as Bishop of Rome. And then very often <laughs> uh, the architects of that time and the most important architects like Bernini were, using, were participating at the construction of ephemeral mountains. This is a really built mountain in the most important place of Rome, Piazza di Spagna. As you know, here we have these famous stair steps which go out uh, up to the Villa Medici. <laughs> and for the important ceremonies, the birth of a child who will become the King of France or the King of Spain and etc. <clears throat> Archi uh, architects, artists work together, this is Bernini again, to build ephemeral mountains, which were of course very, very complex constructions because it's easy to imagine smaller size mountains, but in order to do this, uh, this was extremely expensive. And why did they do this? Because this was a way to, to, to <coughs> express important messages. Like if this was done in order to celebrate, I don't know, the birth of the child of the Spanish family, this means that the Habsburg, the, <clears throat> the Spanish uh, kings, they expressed, we are ruling the world, we are controlling it. <laughs> so this is a sort of symbolical use of ephemeral architecture, and it crosses really the 16th and 17th century. You see many, <laughs> many of these constructions some were ephemeral, some were even <coughs> used in order uh, to make them um, for fireworks. So sometimes people will build these <coughs> for mountains, especially in Rome, as fireworks, and then they were exploded and they expressed <coughs> again the greatness of some message. You, here you see we have libraries, we have in, really a whole bunch of these uh, constructions made especially in 17th century Baroque Rome. <clears throat> and then uh, in the 18th century, this tradition of building artificial mountains was <clears throat> again transformed by the French Revolution. We know that the French Revolution had, a, let's say, a semiotic problem. <clears throat> They wanted to show that they were the new society and the new world they were building, and that this was finally a new, more adequate political form for living together. But at the same time, <laughs> they still wanted to be religious, but they didn't want the old religious forms, the cross, the forms linked to Christianism. So they were very interested in using new symbols and they found as a mutant, at the main symbol, the mountain. And uh, there was a party too called the uh, uh, Parti de la Montagne, the party of the mountain. <laughs> and then they started to use a mountain, artificial mountains. And <laughs> in order to celebrate the most important celebrations for the revolution, where the revolution celebrated itself, if we can say so, was by using four mountains. And in 1794, there was an incredible, <clears throat> we could call it today a happening. It was a celebration. It was a feast of the revolution at a place called now the place of the reunion <laughs> where all friends came together and 260,000 people were there 
around a four mountain, which was constructed <clears throat> by Jean-Louis David, very famous painter, but at the same time, the chief architect and the chief organizer of all the celebrations of the revolution. And 3,000 people were singing on this mountain <laughs> and uh, all around we had people who were listening. So you see the mountain and the artificial mountain with some other symbols linked to French Revolution as a symbol of the renewal, a new era. We are changing everything. Here you see another <laughs> representation of these very impressive mountains. And of course, building these mountains is not an easy task and it would do, have to do it today, it would take us a lot of energy <clears throat> and a lot of time. So you see, for mountains becomes a very interesting theme, not only in Europe, it's of course very present in another form <clears throat> in Asia, in China, and in many other uh, countries around Asia, where we find <clears throat> in Japan too, when of course mountains, it can be Mount Fuji, it can be the five sacred mountains, we can think about the Daisen Inn. So I think it's a quite <clears throat> universal theme, for instance, in Japan, especially from the 17th century onwards, it became very fashionable. And then it becomes really topical in the 19th century to build four, four Mount Fujis <clears throat> and other topographical reproductions of mountains. <clears throat> then coming back to Europe, <coughs> I will give you just some other examples. Here we are in the 18th century. This is a faux volcano. It was built by a German prince in Germany <clears throat> because he traveled, of course, to Italy and he saw the volcanoes. He may even made the ascent of Mount Vesuvius in Naples, which at that time was quite dangerous. There were eruptions and everyone was incredibly interested in these eruptions. And there was a very complicated scientific discourse linked to this because it was linked to the question of the origin of mountains. Are they volcanic or are they Neptunian or geological? <clears throat> and when his prince came back to Germany, he built a full mountain, so a full volcano. <clears throat> and this full volcano, once a year it was lit and there was a sort of full <clears throat> artificial explosion. And you have the material used outside the basalt and there was a discussion going on, is basalt volcanic or not? So you see, this is not only uh, for decoration. It was a sort of symbolic mountain in order to <clears throat> take a position into a discourse linked to origins of the mountains. Or another German <clears throat> prince, Prince Pückler in the 19th century, when he died, he was buried in this mountain, which is interesting, you know, as an artist and landscape architect, you find your place, your last burial site in a mountain which you projected yourself here. It's pyramids, because pyramids, <clears throat> full pyramids, full mountains in the form of pyramids became very fashionable <clears throat> in the 19th century. We had this already saw some <coughs> of these models or reliefs which were important. And around 1900, this is the first, <clears throat> the, first the second national exhibition in Geneva, Swiss National Exhibition, and uh, uh, a landscape architect built there a uh, Swiss village with a, on a full mountain. And we have all kinds of full mountains. We <coughs> can go back, for instance, to Great Britain, Stoke on, Brent, on Stoke on Trent, when we are, uh, have to consider, uh, you know, when you extract coal, the whole coal industry has some side products and the side products are these artificial mountains. But at the time they're covered by grass and we think they're natural, why they're not natural. I already spoke about the symbolic residual material of World War II. Then we have all over the world, <coughs> we have uh, dump sites, we have all kinds of <coughs> things and this come, brings me back to my general idea. We humans, <laughs> we extract things, especially in order to build, even to survive, to heat, to make energy, etc. And then uh, we are faced with a problem, a very, very <clears throat> problem we all know of. We use these dump sites and then they are there and then they become a problem <clears throat> and what to do about them. When they're out of sight, they don't disturb us so much, so much, but still our earth is all marked by them. 
And so what happens to these places? Things of Wurtynski's photographs, which show us all these places, amazing places. They have a sort of paradoxical beauty, but of course it, they're terrible <laughs> at the same time. And then uh, for mountains become a very important theme of landscape architecture too. This is Carl Theodor Sorensen <clears throat> and uh, uh, one of these um, open air theaters, which he didn't build in this form, but he built some others. Or this is the Swiss landscape architect called Ernst Kramer, and he built <clears throat> in 1959 the so called Garden of the Poet. And he used this form, <clears throat> which is a geometrical form, and which was quite shocking and surprising at that time. <clears throat> or we see Dieter Kienast, another well known <clears throat> Swiss landscape architect, who in Graz took up again the same form. And there are many, many examples. In the, you, here you see the artificial topography. So <clears throat> very often it's linked to residual material we don't know what to do with. And then we create a sort of artificial topography in order to create these mountains or uh, Jacques Wirtz, <clears throat> a Belgian landscape architect and gardener. He liked these forms too. And Isamu Noguchi. <clears throat> and we have many, many examples. So you see, when you start to dig into, <coughs> into artificial mountains, we found so many examples, some built, many built, some unbuilt, like Bruno Taut's famous Alpine architecture. Bruno Taut, who <clears throat> at the beginning of his career wanted to transform the Alps into something even bigger. He was shocked by World War I, by violence, by the terrible destruction of the earth <laughs> to World War I. And he said, in order, we need some. we would build all together a crystal mountain which would crown the existing mountains, the Alps, then we would have something formidable. <clears throat> and so he imagined in the Alpine architecture, these pure crystal constructions, which are really amazing. But this is an idea which is somewhere there in expressionistic architecture of the 20th, 30s, in Finsterlin, in Hablik, in many, many other artists too. <laughs> even we could say, and we could even show it, that <clears throat> there is a mimetic relation between the Sagrada Familia, Gaudi's masterwork in Barcelona, and the mountains which are called Monserrate, which are the sacred mountains of Catalonia, a sort of imitation. So you see, <clears throat> the mountains are everywhere. And in order to come to the end of this very, very rapid uh, excursion, <laughs> I would come to Robert Smithson. Because I think Robert Smithson was really fascinated with the form of the mountain, with the form of heaps, mountains, hills, everything man-made. <clears throat> and we have this wonderful drawing called of heap of language, where he thinks about how language is, well, languages are built up like mountains. Today we speak English or we speak our languages <clears throat> automatically. Uh, we don't have to work on how to speak English or how to speak our language in order to speak well. But in reality, we are the results of a stratification and of work done by generations and generations and generations. So even languages are in a certain way mountains. They are the result of the energies, of the mental energies and of the intellectual energies and of the imagination of, gener of generation past. <clears throat> and of course, many of these masterworks for example, one of the works which still exists, Spiral Hill in Holland, in Emmen. <coughs> there we see a full mountain, and the full mountain is a mountain which turns in the wrong direction. It turns leftwards because left, <coughs> the left is the wrong direction in the Christian tradition because of Judas and it, because of other things. And so we have these <coughs> left turning uh, mountain, which in the idea of Smithson is naturally not linked to Christianism, but to entropy. <clears throat> we are linked to entropy. And so you see many of the works of Smithson here, glue pour, when he takes some glue and it pours down and goes down a mountain or a hill, <clears throat> or many other works are 
absolutely linked to the idea of mountains, the wonderful idea of creating a museum of the void where the museum, the main part, this sublime big <coughs> part would be empty, but you need, you see upstairs, it's full in a Pyrenaean sense of the relics or models or imitations of all these Babel mountains, ziggurats, uh, <coughs> and other mountains which we built. We humans will build mountains, we built Babel, but maybe we have to pay a price for it too. And he was so fascinated that he goes on and on with building these hills. You see islands <coughs> piled, pill, pile, where material is piled up, or again, <coughs> spiral hills, other spiral hills, spiralic forms. And even his most famous, and I will finish with this, even his most famous work, of course, the spiral jetty, which we all know, where the spiral jetty, <coughs> in a certain sense, is a conical form which disappears in the water and then it comes back. So it's a negative mountain like Dante's conic form. But what he wanted to do, he wanted to build a small museum and the museum would, will, would be again, a small foam mountain. And inside the foam mountain, there would be a projection room. So once people discovered the, the spiral jetty and walked around, <coughs> they would go into the full mountain and discover another, another story. They would see the spiral jetty in a, another form. There would be a projection room. So you see this idea of the rock and of the cinema cavern <coughs> in order to let, uh, to let people discover <coughs> the spiral jetty in another form. This is again something linked to the for mountain. So I think it's really a very, very theme. And if I would have had more time, we could show how for all these cases, Baroque Rome, 18th century Germany, 19th century Parisian parks, 20th century garbage mountains in Germany, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there are particular stories which show us how rich this theme really is. So thanks already for your attention. Professor Jacob, that was uh, incredible. Um, thank you for sharing sharing with all of us, and um, and uh, I'm really I'm really excited to have a to have a conversation. Um, perhaps uh, my first um, enthusiastic response is that all of a sudden, as you've said, mountains are everywhere, and and everything becomes a mountain uh, to to some degree. So it's a, it's a really wonderful um, focus for how we can interpret uh, both our histories, culture, and, uh, and the way that land is represented across, across the entire globe. So in a way, the mountain is planetary. The mountain is a kind of, um, and perhaps I have my own biases about this position, but the, that the, the mountain as an object uh, can be found across the entire planet. Therefore, it's, it's translated. And I think I, I, I really appreciate your, your comment about the language. Um, because then it becomes a form of language uh, in and of itself. Um, my, my first, perhaps, question to, to launch us into a conversation is um, I, was, I couldn't help th uh, think uh, the entire time about how, um, in, two, in, in two ways, one, the mountain uh, is an object of topography, and for so much of your presentation, I was thinking that it's an object uh, that an object without an inside. And then here we are on this final image. And in fact, the mountain is and can be a kind of carved underground um, that would particularly relate to the forms of imagination. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like not until we can get inside the mountain that we imagine other worlds or imagine other other uh, conditions. But perhaps you want to make a comment uh, and, and, and kind of flesh out um, this sort of mountain as object or uh, mountain with an inside? Okay, so two rapid comments. The first one, uh, I very much agree that even in places where there are no mountains, the mountains are there. For instance, take Holland, which is, as everyone knows, a flat country, but uh, there are 
small mountains, for example, garbage mountains, and they even call it the Dutch mountain. So mm -hmm. the form of the mountains becomes universal, even if we speak about pseudo mountains or faux mountains, and then of course the language and other forms. And inside outside, what you see, at least in the European tradition, it really starts with a double perspective. We have the building of these four mountains, but immediately we have the design, the interior design of the same mountains at the same time, which is quite amazing. So <clears throat> I think at least at the beginning, there was an interest. And when I showed you, for instance, this German very strange uh, Prince, Prince Buckler, very important for the history of picturesque gardens, and so he really builds his pyramid in order at his death, so in order to disappear into the mountain. Mm. So he is, there is a sort of final fusion with the mountains. So what can you do more sentimentally than trying to become one with your work of art? Mm. Amazing. So, so sort of occupying, occupying the mountain or, or, because in a lot, in, in the mountain. I'm sorry, say again? Yeah, living the mountain, being inside the mountain, which is of course very difficult. You can do it symbolically when you enter a grotto, but you cannot really be there forever. Unless you choose like Prince Buckler to become one because you're buried there. It's right. only his heart which was put in there, etc. Right, only until death do you occupy the mountain perhaps in some instances, which is <laughs> kind of morbid, but also uh, peculiar. Yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe the other comment um, is that it, the depictions of these artificial mountains makes me wonder uh, the, the kind of questions that we often pose in landscape uh, discourse uh, is, um, has, nature, has nature ever been natural? Um, and, and, and maybe you can uh, um, comment on that. Yeah, I think it's a very, it's a very interesting question. <clears throat> um, today we live in the era of the religion of nature. Mm -hmm. The traditional religions are not very, in, not in very good health. I mean, at least in Europe, the churches are quite empty, except of tourists. But <clears throat> classical forms of religion, I don't want to say that they tend to disappear, but they were in a deep crisis for many reasons, which don't have it's not our subject, but we have a new religion of na nature. Everyone loves nature. People hug trees. The cooks, <laughs> speak with, the cooks like to speak with tomatoes, and they hug, uh, they hug the potatoes and everything. So if you don't love nature, and then we have Greta, etc. If you love, if you really don't love nature, you're a bad guy. So nature is everywhere, and we forget that nature doesn't care for us. Nature is not about mankind. <clears throat> so, and, uh, so this is the first general remark. And this religion of nature makes us forget <clears throat> that, for instance, to be interested in nature is not natural. It's very human. Only we human beings, and I would say we civilized human beings with everything positive and negative, which is contained in civilized, we are interested in nature. Normally, I mean, traditionally, People who work in nature, think about people who really work with nature, people who have to feed themselves from nature. They don't have a sentimental view of nature. If you have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and work for hours just to survive, you won't have the same bourgeois attitude to be there and to say, oh, how wonderful. So I think you're completely right. We very often make, have a deep confusion when we're con concerned with nature. And I think our contemporary longing and celebration of nature is a very, very recent phenomenon. It's really very recent. And especially when we deal with landscape architecture, et cetera, it's very important to teach our students to tell them, listen, don't make a confusion about nature. At least in Europe, it's very difficult to find any natural spot unless you go to Iceland somewhere, because already the Romans transformed everything. They built mountains, they destroyed mountains, they changed the course of rivers and so on. So what is natural? And people say the Swiss Alps or the Alps in general. No, it's completely wrong because the Alps are 
thousands and thousands and thousands of artificial constructions. There is no, not one single natural waterfall. Everything is controlled by hydroelectricity. Hydro so what is natural? And so we could discuss a long time about what is natural. And I agree that the for mountain could be a very good symbol of mankind, of we humans transforming nature. That's amazing. It, it also makes me uh, think about the, you know, the, the narration about the, the seven hills of Rome, that Rome was built upon seven hills and the, therefore Rome was naturalized by a kind of uh, existential re reference to its setting. And yet it's really just a constructed image to, to form a, a kind of um, politic about its, uh, about its construction. Yeah, but at least the Romans could have said, okay, these hills were there, and then we used them to build on the top of these hills. Right. But uh, later on, because this is a mythical formation of Rome, right. but in classical Rome, let's see in more recent times, they changed they, everything they could change. Mm. Well, um, I was actually quite interested in the possibility you raised about um, turning this... Um, imagination in the other direction. So making sort of uh, positive aspects work for us in terms of, of, of this idea of renewal that you raised of sort of building a mountain is not something that's always destructive or counter natural, but maybe it's something we can use to recycle the materials that we waste. And then this, this active renewal is is in in the process of building the mountain. So in this day and age, when the, you know, the ecological concern is is the the utmost importance, maybe this idea of full mountain could become a vehicle for um, environmental change as well. I agree with you. I, I think uh, especially the mountains of Renaissance are very very interesting in this context because. Uh, we could say that uh, Mount Parnassus in the Renaissance is a mountain of optimism. It's mm -hmm. the optimism of humans who define themselves as the ones who can design their own world. They are the masters of the design and of the transformation after, and the responsibility of transformation. And that's Renaissance. Renaissance means we won't accept any more uh, as the Middle Ages have taught us, stay at your place, obey. Now we have a new model. We are at the center of everything and we are responsible. And so we have to build. And the mountain, the artificial mountain of the Renaissance is both this. It is the optimistic sign of the renewal and but at the same time this renewal because it is Renaissance. It uses the material of the past and especially of the Greek and Roman past in order to build something completely new. So we can read it in both directions. We, I agree, we can read it as a formidable sign of renewal. And even the Brit Chaumont in, in 19th century <clears throat> in Paris, they're completely artificial. They're completely fake, but they were the most celebrated symbol of the 1867 exhibition, world exhibition in Paris. And this, the message is very clear. We, and who is we? Engineers. We engineers, we can build everything. We can do everything. We can even build mountains, no problem. And we can put the train inside and you can even see it. And we, we can build a waterfall. And we, are, we can build even better than nature because we have concrete. So I agree completely that you can read it always in both sides. You can build it as a metaphor of the almost destruction of nature and maybe of a misuse, but at the same time, they are signs of collective optimism of the mm. possibility to really build the future. Absolutely. Mm. Very, very well said and so, so helpful um, when, we, when we grapple with these questions about landscape. And, uh, and, and its association with culture and perhaps the, 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 the fabrication of the garden as, a, as, as you've described by the engineers uh, being the form of, uh, of paradise in a way and in the most extreme way. 
Uh, and yet it's, um, it's, it's, it's a really helpful way to, th to think about um, the role of architects, landscape architects, urban, urban designers, and so forth to, to uh, reflect on our, our position uh, as it relates to uh, perhaps broader questions about the environment in a contemporary context. So wonderful discussion. I, w I wish we had more time to, to continue the, the, the talk. Hopefully we can uh, collaborate in future, in future efforts as we were talking about before. Great, no, no, I'm looking forward to this. Yes, I think the next invitation definitely have to uh, be a physical trip, an actual trip to, to Seoul, so we can all meet here on our mountain in, in, inside Korea. Yeah, so <laughs> Namsan. <laughs> yes. I, I, I kept thinking about Namsan the whole time. Okay. Very, very artificial indeed, yes. <laughs> well, thank so you, Professor thank Jacob. You thank you very thank much you. for joining us. We very, let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.